12 years ago, I got a call from my wife. Come quick to emergency. It looks like Hayden has type 1 diabetes. Hayden is our son. Our lives had suddenly taken a sharp right-hand turn. At the hospital that day, we resolved to do anything we could to help Hayden and the millions of others around the world living with type 1 diabetes. When I got that call, I was working for General Electric on power plant automation. I thought, why should I work on something so trivial as the world's energy problem when I could be applying my skills and experience to something much more impactful? Within months, I'd be at the largest medical device company in the world, leading the team engineering the next steps towards the artificial pancreas. It might seem like a big jump to go from power plant automation to diabetes, but I'd made big jumps before, and I was prepared. Now I'll tell you how. This talk is about applying knowledge from one domain to solving problems in another. I'll share the challenges, their solutions, and the rewards from my experience jumping across five domains. If I can do it, so can you. Exactly 30 years ago, I was a new grad student at Queen's. My supervisor, Dr. Tom Harris, yes, that Tom Harris, had convinced me to come to Queen's to flesh out a new research area. One of the many things Tom taught me, and this is my first lesson, beware exclusionary language. Different domains use different words for the same thing. Don't just go to the ChemEng library, he told me. Go to the electrical engineering, but they'll call what you're doing the Z-transform. Go back further to the Douglas Library and look in the econometrics literature, but they'll call it the backward shift operator. Or go back even further to the math and statistics library, but they'll call it Q to the minus one. They're all the same thing. Knowing about exclusionary language helped me 20 years later when doctors at a conference kept saying postprandial hyperglycemia, and I realized, oh, they mean blood sugar goes up after eating. Got it. Grad school treated me well. Fastest successful thesis defense in the department, best paper award, a technology licensing deal. Our work was widely cited academically, widely applied in industry. It felt great to have reached a summit early in my career. It would have been easy to stay in academia. In fact, I had a full scholarship for a PhD. Instead, my wife, a Queen's nurse, and I ventured west to Alberta where I took a job as a control engineer at a large chemical plant. Jump number one, from academia to industry. There, I cut my teeth on what today are known as cyber-physical systems, humans, computers, and machines working together. In academia, a lot of material is crammed into a short period of time. At least in my engineering experience, this leads to oversimplification, to the development of toy solutions to toy problems or overly complex and impractical solutions. Freshly minted PhDs would show up at our plant and implement their grad school's professor's favorite toy algorithm. And by the second or third time they got called out to the plant by the operators over the weekend or in the middle of the night to fix their complex toy algorithm, they figured out, you know, maybe simpler is better. While working at this plant, I was put on a special project which took me all over the world evaluating technology. Korea, Japan, the United States, a light went off for me. Do I really want to settle down and spend the rest of my days in central Alberta? Which is a great place, but there's a big world out there. Within months, I got a job with Honeywell in Southern California. So jump number two, from chemical production to industrial automation. My first day of work was in France, in a room full of French and Korean engineers. Responsible for new product in a new domain I knew nothing about, or the refinery blend planning and scheduling automation, I thought, what have I done? My wife was two months pregnant with our first child, who incidentally just graduated from nursing at Queens. Um, so we were in a new country, new job, new house, new company, new domain. The engineers were talking about these complex multidimensional polyhedra called zonotopes. Once I figured out they were basically taking the determinant of a matrix, something we learned in high school, I realized I can do this, and I did. For the next 13 years at Honeywell, I traveled all over the world in a variety of engineering, marketing, business development, and strategic roles. Not all of the things I was asked to do made sense at the time. I was asked to lead a team in a technology area in which I had no interest and no experience. But the learnings from that project still apply 25 years later. Another time, 
I was asked to resolve a fight between two huge divisions. Not very much fun at the time, but the methods, tools, and processes developed were later applied with great success outside of Honeywell. Which brings me to lesson two. Just do it. Suck it up, buttercup. The things you're asked to do don't always make sense at the time. Just do them and do them well. The things I'm now very good at and love to do, I didn't start out liking them. Sailboat racing started with fear and dread. Calculus, hard, irrelevant. Statistics, ooh, scary. Marketing, scorn. Running, painful. Yet these are my great joys in life now, and I'm very good at them. On a visit to Bangalore, India, many years ago, we were hiring junior software engineers, many of whom wanted to work on the coolest projects. A friend said something to me I'll never forget. You have to do the donkey work before you can do the horsework. It may seem beneath you or tangential or retrograde or a waste of your time. It certainly did for me. But doing donkey work, horsework, or any work you were being asked to do will help you down the line. And by continuing to do the donkey work, at least occasionally, you stay grounded, practical, and empathetic. You understand where those folks in marketing are coming from because you once spent time in marketing or the struggles those junior engineers are having with the new software. But most importantly, leading companies like Toyota have figured out that the most valuable people in the company are those who are closest to the customer, the ones doing the donkey work. Not those at the top of the company occupying what we used to call the mahogany wind tunnel. They're the farthest from the customers. Cling to the rock of customer value and you will be successful. Lesson three, compounding. I love doing new things. I love to learn and I love to make connections. These investments compound over time. Like exercise, like saving money. Small investments grow large over time. So pay yourself first. Don't do these things as an afterthought or at the end of the day or with what's left of your paycheck. Take these things off the top. Do them deliberately. One investment I regret not starting much earlier is the investment in physical fitness. At 39, worried about my health, I, I signed up for a full marathon, having never ran more than a mile in my life. I've now ran a dozen marathons, including the Boston Marathon, the year of the bombing. I want to move on now and talk about how a different investment paid off for me, an investment in maintaining connections. One day, I got called by a colleague who had moved to GE. She said, Lane, we're starting a new group and think you'd be the perfect addition. Jump number three to power generation, systems engineering. That's where I was the day we learned our son had diabetes. Two months after he was diagnosed, curious about the application of automation to insulin delivery, the so-called artificial pancreas, I went to a diabetes technology conference. Three important things happened at that conference. First, I was able to quickly understand what they were talking about, like postprandial hyperlysemia. Some things were cloaked in exclusionary language, which I knew I could overcome. Second, the FDA gave an update on automated insulin delivery. I asked, has the FDA reached out to the FAA and other regulatory agencies for whom control in safety-critical socio-technical systems is well understood? No. Do you have any names? Clearly, there was an opportunity to accelerate progress and stand on the shoulders of giants. And the last thing that happened, I bumped into the chief technology officer of Medtronic Diabetes, the largest and most successful medical device company in the world. We had lunch, and we're soon talking about me joining Medtronic. Jump number four, from power generation to medical device development. Within months, I was at Medtronic, leading the team engineering the artificial pancreas, or what we now call automated insulin delivery. Which brings me to lesson four. It's the questions, not the answers, that are important. The education system grills us on the answers to questions. It beats the why out of most of us by grade three. Never stop asking why. Why is the most important question, and questions are much more important than answers. In today's world, the answers are easy. Just ask Alexa, Siri, or Google. The answer to every question ever posed to humankind is at your fingertips. 
Your challenge is to discover and ask the right questions at the right time. Here's a question I asked that literally changed the world. My wife and I were getting up many times through the night to see if our son's blood glucose was safe. At GE, we were remotely monitoring thousands of power plants around the world, aircraft in flight, locomotives going down the tracks. Here's the question I asked. Why can I see any number in the world on my iPhone except the most important number in my world, Hayden's blood glucose? Turns out there was no technical reason. So I got together with a couple other engineers and in our spare time built Night Scout, free software used by tens of thousands of families all over the world, the first remote monitoring system for people with type 1 diabetes. Now their loved ones can support them overnight at school, at sports or at grandma's house, a sleepover or a play date. Incidentally, for those of you who've heard of GitHub, Night Scout is in the top 10 most forked repositories out of about 4 million. Night Scout also sparked a DIY, we are not waiting movement of consumer led innovation in diabetes technology, which has done more to innovate wearables and automated insulin delivery in the past five years than industry in the previous 20. Never stop asking questions. After nearly five years at Medtronic, with Hayden now entering puberty, I realized that Medtronic wasn't moving fast enough. So I started Bigfoot Biomedical with two other D-dads. Jump number five, from what Tony Fadel, the inventor of the Nest thermostat, calls big, dumb, slow companies, to small, innovative, agile startups. It's been quite a ride. Bigfoot has raised over $100 million and hopes to be on the market this year. I've since left Bigfoot to start Nudge BG, an automated insulin delivery software and consulting company. Which brings me to lesson four, practice. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time to get good at something. Years ago, a running friend told me that running 30 kilometers a week wasn't enough, that I needed to run more to change the vascularization of my legs, to increase my aerobic capacity, to perform at my potential. So I did. Running has become a hugely beneficial part of my life, both physically and mentally. I've ran every day for the past four years, over 1,400 days in a row, an average of 10K per day. Running keeps me healthy, it gives me constant endorphin rush, and the quiet, no music, no distractions, gives my brain a chance to think free from the noise of today's world. My best ideas come when I'm running. It's the same with the ripples in the pond of life. The more jumps you do, the better you get at jumping the easier it gets. So when our family was confronted with its biggest challenge, Hayden's diagnosis, I was prepared to jump. I had practiced, I knew I could, and I did. I was on a run a few weeks ago, a run I've done many times up a steep climb to the top of a mountain. And as I crested the summit, I didn't break stride and continued right back down the other side. How come I didn't stop? That was weird. Don't most people stop on the summit to enjoy the view? That's when it hit me. I don't spend time on the summits, on the summit of that mountain or on the summit of any of the things I've done in my professional life. If I'd stopped on my first summit, would I have achieved my next and the one after that and the one after that? It's the journey, not the destination. I've also found that my highest achievements have come after a rough spot, coming down from a summit. You have many summits ahead of you, personally, professionally. Don't let past accomplishments hold you back. Forward, forward, forward. So this is my final lesson. Don't spend time on the summit. I could have stayed in academia or at that chemical plant in Alberta. Instead, my career has jumped across six industries at 11 companies, working for 25 bosses. I've been around the world three times. I've visited 30 countries. Do you want 30 years of experience or one year of experience repeated 30 times? Look, I'm not particularly innovative or smart. I have very few original thoughts, but I've developed through a lot of experience and a great network of friends and colleagues an ability to jump to new domains and make meaningful contributions. How? Overcome exclusionary language. Gain a broad experience base. Compound. Pay yourself first. Keep asking questions. Practice, practice, practice. 
What might seem an impossible problem in one domain has almost certainly been solved elsewhere. As science fiction author William Gibson has observed, the future is already here, it just hasn't been evenly distributed yet. Go distribute that future. Thank you.